googled Dreamforce, and I saw it said Bruno Mars is going to be there, and Al Gore is going to be there, and I was like, oh, <laughs> this sounds kind of cool. That is Adam Olshansky, a Salesforce engineer over at Google. I'm Josh Burke, a developer evangelist at Salesforce, and here on the Salesforce Developer Podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Now, today, we sit down with Adam and talk about a wide range of topics, including getting certified, as well as perspectives that we can have as admin developers on various tasks. We'll start with certification, where Adam has a little bit of advice on some place near and dear to my heart, Trailhead. The first place I, I recommend people to go, um, and if for nothing else, then to just learn the terminology and learn what's out there. There's so many things on Salesforce now, it's almost impossible to know everything the platform can do. For example, I discovered that platform cache was a thing from a Trailhead module and then presented on Dreamforce about it later. So basically, for any certification you're looking at, Trailhead's always the first place I tell people to go. The study guide, obviously, is also a great place. You know what it is you have to you know, know. And the study guides will usually have some good links as well. Some of them are on Trailhead. Some of them are on, you know, various documentation links and things like that. And then the other thing I'd recommend, there's a ton of great, well, one of the things I love about the Salesforce community is it's all about helping each other grow, right? You look at the whole notion of, of from the very top, Salesforce's one 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 model. It's about helping others. It's about giving back. Uh, and the Salesforce community, the Ohana has really embraced that. And so pretty much for any certification now, you can Google, you know, X certification study tips and, and some links with good content on things to practice, things to understand, things to learn uh, for that exam. My biggest tip is probably just go ahead and schedule the exam, even if it's six months out, a year out, just having it on the calendar. I, I've noticed for myself, if I don't have a deadline for something, it's always going to go to the back of my to-do list. Now, I myself have often said that there's no better deadline than one in front of a live audience. Now, Adam also has a little bit of advice when it comes to taking the test, including getting a good night's sleep. Uh, make sure you're, you know, well rested, well fed, <laughs> and then I, I, I try to to pace myself during the exam. So if I know it's sixty questions and I have two hours, I'll do kind of periodic check-ins every five or ten questions. Okay, am I on track? Do I need to pick it up a little bit? Can I slow down a little bit? And then the certifications are nice because they have the option to mark this for review. And so I kind of use that as my own kind of verification. So I don't always have time at the end to go through all of the questions and look at them all again. And so basically anything that I'm not more than 80% sure on, I'll click the mark for review button. And then at the end, I'll try to go back in and see, okay, of the ones I marked for review, do I want to change my answer? Or if nothing else, do I want to figure out what topic it's asking about? So sometimes I'll see hey, I marked three questions for review all around the same topic. Pass or fail, I know I need to study that some more. Which brings up an interesting point. Remember when taking the test that sometimes failure is just part of the process. Yeah, I, I would say it's defi you're definitely not alone, right? I think it at the time was advanced developer, but it took me, I don't remember, three, four, five tries to finally pass that one. So it, there, there's a couple things you can take from it. One of the nice things I really like that Salesforce is doing now is they kind of send you the summary of how you did by section. So you kind of have an indication of, was I close? What areas do I need to study? Things like that. But ultimately, it's a, a learning experience as with anything, right? The one thing I tell people also with certifications is don't go after the certification just to have it. Go after the certification to actually learn the content in depth so you can back up the piece of paper that says that you're certified. Switching topics a little bit, I wanted to ask Adam about something that I have had some actual personal involvement with, having put Adam on stage several times myself. I wanted to get a little bit of behind his process of, of stagecraft and slidecraft, and starting with what topic do you want to actually speak on? Yeah, so I actually uh, wrote a blog post about this a couple months ago that I'd be happy to, to share. But my first tip would always be to pick a topic you're passionate about, right? It's always easier and also more fun <laughs> to be able to create a presentation about something that you really care about. The next tip I would say is try to pick a topic you have some experience with. You know, I really might love a feature, but if I've never used it before, it's going to be a little bit harder to teach others about it. That being said, it could also be a fun challenge to uh, force yourself to learn something if you know that you have to present on it in a couple of months. <laughs> so, you know, use some caution with that. But that would be kind of a, a personal way to choose a topic. Uh, the next thing I tell people is kind of look for what is popular with Salesforce and in the industry at the moment. 
as an example, you may love S controls. Chances are no one's going to go to that presentation. <laughs> Having started my Salesforce career editing and debugging S controls, I can tell you he's right about that one. Now, Adam also had a little bit of advice when it came to connecting yourself with the topic you're looking at. Find some way to incorporate something that's kind of unique to you. Why are you the best person to present on this topic? And I think that really helps shine through the presentation as well. If there's kind of a unique take on something, even if it's been presented before, maybe you have a new idea for it or a, a different perspective. And then the last thing, one of the great things about Salesforce is you can really think outside the box. Dreamforce specifically, there are sessions on equality, mindfulness, career development. It doesn't have to be a technical session. And it also doesn't have to be a 40-minute session. You know, Amy uh, Uplinger Singh gave a great session on imposter syndrome. Uh, it's a 20-minute theater session, something that I personally suffer from myself, I think is very relatable and, and very useful. So even though it's not a, a technical topic per se, it's still a topic that you can speak to that uh, people want to hear about. Now, in my many years of doing session management, I have noticed that people have, shall we say, a wide variety of strategies when it comes to submitting papers. Some submit one, some submit a few, and some submit 20 to 30. And I was just kind of curious as to add a strategy on. Yeah, so I, I would say I always go for quality over quantity uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, creating presentation ideas isn't easy and it isn't quick. And so if I'm going to come up with a presentation idea, I'm probably going to spend a couple hours crafting it, writing the abstract, rewriting the abstract, um, and really making it something worthy of submitting. The other side of it is, and I guess you can't do this anymore, but if I submit 20 sessions and they all get accepted, I now have two options. Number one, I have to create 20 presentations. Or number two, I stole 15 to 18 slots from other deserving people. And so I would say for, for all of those reasons, and I think Dreamforce limits it to five now, but uh, I, I try to limit it to one or two personally. Number one, you know, even if you're presenting three sessions at Dreamforce, it's going to be hard to enjoy the rest of Dreamforce. Now, as somebody who has a lot of experience with this on the other side of accepting and evaluating sessions, I, I can say, first of all, I'll, I'll try to stay off of a soapbox. But first of all, Adam's right. We want to be mindful of the speaker experience and not overtasking people, which is one of the reasons why we started limiting the number of submissions to five. And we typically do not try to give more than three talks to a single speaker. And I think his, his number is also about right. I usually recommend about two to four submissions and give us a variety of topics when it comes to things you want to talk about and maybe a good theater session and a good breakout session. Of course, we don't really know what formats we're going to be doing with Dreamforce this year, but to keep an eye out for that as we get closer to the event. Now, moving topics a little bit here, we want to talk about something that Adam has presented on uh, frequently. And this is using the perspective of one role for a different role's task. For instance, being an admin and looking at code. But yeah, so uh, this kind of goes back to, you know, something that I'm passionate about. You know, I was talking about how to come up with ideas to present on. I'm really passionate about this notion that anybody can be a Salesforce developer. Um, I really love the Salesforce focus is on equality, regardless of your, you know, race, gender, color, background. Anybody can be a, a developer. And so I, I do volunteer with Rad Women, and I really am passionate about helping anybody in the Salesforce ecosystem become a developer. And, you know, when I was kind of learning about the declarative side and the programmatic side, and even now, I, I kind of, it's my strong belief that declarative developers and programmatic developers are doing pretty much the same thing, just in a different way. And so, you know, when you think about declarative developer, you're using all these different tools, right? You have conditional logic and formula fields, you have you know, creating fields with different names and different data types. You're chaining logic together in process builder and flow. You're querying for records and reports. You're, you know, running automation based on record events and workflow and process builder. You're looping over collections and flows. You're manipulating records and workflow process builder and flow. And those are all the exact same building blocks of code. And so if you already understand all these concepts and understand how they work and what they're doing, all you're missing is the syntax for Apex. And so my, my kind of approach to this presentation is helping admins understand that looking at code doesn't have to be foreign, looking at code doesn't have to be gibberish, because you already know how to do all of these things. 
Uh, you just need to understand the syntax of what it looks like uh, from a programmatic perspective. But the concepts, you're already doing them. And I think it's interesting that, like, like as a developer, it can also work in the reverse. So, for instance, uh, there was a thread, I think it was on Twitter, talking about, you know, a lot of our branding with declarative versus programmatic also goes to, like, no-code, low-code, pro-code, that kind of thing. And the conversation was kind of leaning towards looking at a tool like Flow more like, more like visual coding as opposed to not coding at all. Well, yeah, I always tell people, I personally think that writing a flow is harder than writing code. <laughs> um, so <laughs> if, if you're a flow knack and you mastered flows, code's going to be mm -hmm. a piece of cake for you because you're, you're already doing all that stuff with a lot of clicks, but it's right. a lot of the same stuff on the code side. And if I'm a developer who's like worked at a lot of Apex and using that kind of, you know, quote unquote, high code or whatever, is it also useful for me to kind of to engender that process and... Uh, start learning how Flow can kind of coexist with my code base. I, I would definitely say yes. I, I think generally the the mantra is always you know clicks before code. That being said, I definitely have a lot to learn with Flow, and and I know Flow's just really gotten really powerful lately with some of the the before trigger functionality with the revamp to the new uh, Lightning Flow Builder. I think it's called. Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely a, a ton of great stuff in there, and and it's very powerful what you can do with it. And Flow also kind of has the ability to come with built-in UI, so you don't have to build a UI from scratch. So I, I think there are definitely opportunities, if you are a programmatic developer, to accomplish a lot of your tasks. Now, to shift gears just a little bit, Adam's also presented on the concept of an Apex developer, somebody who focuses almost entirely on server-side code, looking at Lightning Web Components. I might say that it's not as challenging as you might think. Um, gotcha. I, I, my, my opinion, JavaScript, I think, is just a different way of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think I, I really like the, the anecdote. JavaScript is to Java like a carpet is to a car. <laughs> it, it, has, <laughs> right. it, it has the same <laughs> base in it, but That's... they're really nothing alike. Right, right. Going back to the little bit of web trivia or not trivia that JavaScript was a name JavaScript mostly for a marketing stunt. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, I <laughs> completely believe that. Uh, but yeah, so I, I don't know if I'd say there are advantages necessarily, but I, I think that there are a lot of similarities. I think with the kind of beyond just being a backend developer, I think I look at it more from the framework perspective, right? If you're working with Apex gotcha. and you're a traditional Salesforce developer, you're probably familiar with the MVC framework. You're familiar with putting things into a controller. You're familiar mm -hmm. with the UI calling your controller, having the UI in visual for us, having tag based markup, having, you know, bind variables, bind methods calling controllers from your visual force and then dealing with your backend data. I think the there are a lot of similarities between that model and the Lightning Web Component model. I like to call it MVC++ because you can have really now as many controllers as you want. Of course, we can talk about a lot of similarities, but there's always a few distinctions that people find. I think the biggest thing that I found is figuring out how to fire events. So with Apex, I'm always, I have a method signature. I put my variables uh, into my, my method signature and I control what gets called and when. And with LWC and, and Aura even, it's dealing with events and event firing and event bubbling and event propagation. And so there is some similarity into how you do it. Um, but I think a little, it's a little bit different when you're capturing events, you're having to name events a certain way, you're having to deal with case sensitivity, which you don't have with Apex. So there is definitely some nuance. But again, once you figure out how events work and you can communicate from component to component and then retrieve the data from the captured event, there are definitely some similarities there, uh, just kind of a different syntax and a different way to to think about it. Now, Adam already mentioned previously that uh, he's a rad women coach, which two thumbs up there. But I did want to give him a chance to plug some of the education he's done up on Pluralsight. Uh, sure. So uh, to date, I have a, a course with Don Robbins. Uh, it's a Salesforce play-by-play -play on migrating to the Lightning experience. So if you have not yet migrated or you know someone who has not yet migrated, uh, they may get some tips from that. And they can check that out at uh, bit.ly slash lightning migration. In general, Don has a ton of great play-by-plays on there, kind of deep dives into different topics with different people. That's our show. Now, before we go, I did ask Adam about his favorite non-technical hobby, and it's one that a lot of people might be picking up these days. Working from home, I don't know if 
cooking as a hobby as much as it is a necessity. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I've been cooking a lot more. Um, that's been a lot of fun. I made some uh, chicken pad thai, um, some spaghetti bolognese, peach cobbler. Nice. So yeah, definitely I've been having uh, a lot of fun with that. I want to thank Adam for the great conversation and information. Of course, thanks to you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old shows, see show notes, and also have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks, and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks.